Remember that prayer circle we did? Pastor Brian says, yes, he goes, I got a job. I'm hired. I'm getting my medical done tomorrow. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen? Be encouraged. I want to hear your testimonies. Amen? It's not one-sided, not a one-way street. It's constant. It's the flow. It's continuance. Amen? See, when, when Dad first gave me the revelation of healing, the full revelation of healing, when I understood what he was talking about, I received it. I made sure that it flowed to others. Amen? Give us your testimony. We want to hear about it and celebrate with you. Amen? Big and Jimmy. doctor tells her, this is your, your prognosis. She begins bold out crying. She has the surgery. She goes through the chemo. Now, her relationship was, with God was very shaky. It was almost non-existent. And I began to speak to her. And I began to tell her, I cancel what the doctor's telling you. Come on. Let me tell you about a man who was diagnosed with leukemia in 1989 and was told he had six months to live. That man was my father. Woo! Come on, come on. And my grandmother at the time told him, you have two options. You believe what comes out of that mouth, or you're gonna surrender to the Lord. My father was the segue for so many people who have leukemia today. He was a guinea pig for the first bone marrow transplant where they discovered that there's a cure. But with that cure came that God answered the prayer for a man who surrendered to the Lord and said, I believe in you. My faith is in your hand. Fast forward to a year later with um, this amazing young lady. Not only is her relationship restored with God, and she is a walking testimony evangelizing to everybody. She didn't have money to go for a CAT scan in order to determine what was going on with her cancer. So, when, so she started tithing to the flow. Wow. I began to speak to her wow. about what it is to tithe and the power of tithing. And she's like, okay, I'm going to do it in faith, okay? I believe you. She comes to me and she says, a random person blessed me and gave me the money for me to do my CAT scan. Wow. She goes for the CAT scan. She comes into my office the next day and she says, cancer free. Oh! And then 
I get my first real job. Yeah. At the time, at the time, oh my God. Two weeks later, I'm full time. Come on. all the resources needed to take care of yourself. Exodus 14, 14 says, confidence is based upon the truth that God is faithful. So tonight, I just want you to put your faith into this basket. Because God, he can do all things. Lord, as these water walkers walk up to the basket of faith, I pray that you multiply their funds that anything that they need right now in the needs of others that they know of that you begin to show yourself true that each eye contact is from you Lord saying I got it I got you Lord I ask that you cover this offering that you bless it and I pray that you overflow it so that we'll be able to bless others we don't know what other people are going through we see smiles we don't know what they're going through. Even a simple hug, an act of kindness, evangelism, anything that you do, it's, it's worth it. I pray that we begin to elevate our faith, that everybody just, just opens up their eyes and that they don't close their eyes to, to those that are out there. There's a lot of people in need that we just overlook. They could be right next to you and you don't even know. So I pray that you open up our eyes and elevate our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Faith. Faith moves mountains, right? Yeah? Amen. Tonight's one of those nights. You guys feel it? I feel it. Yes? Amen. Just know that wherever you stand in life, God is so worthy. God is so mindful. That every time that the enemy is trying to probe, God has your back. Amen? Amen. Amen. Dropping something immense. Hallelujah. So I need you all to do just a, a demonstration of what's going to happen in the spiritual realm. Close your eyes and imagine that there is a scale in your eyes right now. Start peeling that scale right now. Peel the scale out of your eyes right now. Lord, I bind every religious spirit. I cancel what is removing the revelation that is going to be dropped tonight, my King. For your love will be revealed to your people. But most of all, who you are will be shown and demonstrated by our spiritual Father, Dr. Apostle Israel.
Let our souls, my God, connect with our spirit. Let our spirits connect with you, Holy Spirit. Let us be a vessel of your truth tonight so we can demonstrate how deep your love goes. How deep is your love? as you will. Yes, Lord, let your will be done here on earth. Here right now. Here at the flow as it is in heaven. And every person watching by way of internet, all those who were bold enough to show up tonight, be ready to receive this revelation of your truth. How much you love, Lord. No death, no depth, no height, no width, no distance. Nothing can separate us from you. It is your love that always plans ahead. Please listen to what I just said. It is your love that always plans ahead. And what we may not understand right now is because your love is always in motion. What we consider a bad moment is really you orchestrating something behind the scenes. Not even death understands the strategies of your love, my God. So, we've been touching on the disciples of Jesus, the Christ. At that time, Jesus of Nazareth, right? Jesus of Nazareth, who is the Christ. He still had Nazareth there because he was still man. And when we understand this truth, he made a selection. He selected individuals. And those individuals cannot be confused in the Bible. That's the reason why I feel important for us to go over a class like this so we understand who's who. So when we're reading in the book of Acts and we see the same name, we don't go, oh, that must be one of the disciples. No. Some of you still think Luke and Mark are part of the disciples. Luke and Mark are not, well, let me say that better. Some of you think that Luke and Mark are apostles of the 12. They're not. Luke and Mark are disciples. They're not apostles. There is a difference. There were those selected apostolically. And their selection was on purpose. Tonight, for those of you who are taking notes, you really want to take notes on this. If you are taking them, if you're not, then you're going to want to go home and take a look at it again. Because I'm going to say something that is against what you probably have learned for years. And it's quite probable that many of you will leave with a question mark. I hope not. I hope everybody leaves here clear. Amen. 
Tonight is not about removing blame. Tonight is about how deep is his love. And if you stay there, then you won't miss a beat. But if you're looking for justification, your justification, and you're definitely not going to like what, what's going to be spoken tonight. For the church is summed up into one person. The whole church. The whole church is summed up into one person. Wow. The whole church is summed up into one person. One person that was with Jesus. The whole church. Okay. Let's start with Matthew 10. I'm only going to give you Matthew 10 because I want you to understand what's up there. Matthew 10 verse 1 says, Jesus called his 12 disciples together and gave them authority to cast out evil spirits, to heal every kind of disease and illness. These are the 12. Now, in another area it says 12 apostles that he selected amongst the disciples. We already went through that one. So I want you to catch what's going on right now. Jesus selects his Men, the individuals that were going to replicate who he was on earth. They were going to be ambassadors to the king, to the prince of peace, right? So in order to bring peace, you've got to be able to do what the prince of peace does. Which is what? He gave you the authority to do what? To cast out evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness. Here are the name of the 12 apostles. Here are their names. So what does this mean? The authority that was given was given to who? The 12 what? The 12 apostles received what we're going to read right now. I'm going to go step by step with you guys. I know some of you may want to say to me, go through faster. I'm going to go step by step today. I need you to understand the thread. Amen. So 12 apostles who are also disciples were selected and given authority to do what? To cast out demons. To do what? To heal the sick. To do what? Everything that Jesus did. Amen. While Jesus not being present. He sends them out. And who are these 12? Well, we Went through all 11, but one, we didn't mention that last one. So we're going to go through each one, right? So first one was Simon, also called Peter, named by Jesus, Peter. Then Andrew, Peter's brother. James, the son of Zebedee. John, James' brother. Philip, Bartholomew, slash Nathaniel, same person. Thomas, Matthew, the tax collector who's also a son of Alphaeus. James, the son of Alphaeus. Thaddeus. And Simon the Zealot. We went over all these guys. We spent about almost over a month going over every single one of these individuals. Except for one. Who is that person? Judas Iscariot. You gotta be specific because there's another Judy, Judas there. Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed him. So hold on, you're telling me that Judas Iscariot was also given authority and power? I'm asking the question. So, so Judas Iscariot, whose future plan to betray Jesus, that Jesus saw in the future, he was selected because of what he was going to do? So his selection was based on a future event, not a present condition? Are we on the same page? So his selection on the football team was based on his lack of. Not based on what he had, what he was able to bring positively. So he was chosen, you are chosen to do what I do because... Of how bad you are. So what my journey begins here. My journey begins with 
my reading of Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. Now, this again is maybe hard for some people. I'm, I'm releasing this for the first time publicly. Some of y'all know exactly where I'm at because I've taught it in private. But I'm, I'm releasing this for the first time. This revelation, I've had this for years. For years before the flow even started. I shared it with some of you before the flow started. And when I shared it, God kept putting more to it to make sure that it is solid so that when it's given, there's scripture to back it up. How deep is your love? Do not sing the song. Because that's where the mind goes right away. How deep, Lord, is your love? Thank you, Jesus. So what do we see here? Let's go to chapter 21. I'm going to start with verse 10. Chapter 21, verse 10. This is where the journey began. And when God took me on this journey, I was, I was giving him such a hard time. Because to me, it was like, that's not possible. My religious mindset, my desire for God to take care of business with his fist closed instead of his hands open. I was, I was an advocate of the, the zeal and the, the, the vigor and the, the, the judgment of God. I was, I was an advocate. I stood up there in the front telling multitudes about you better get it right or you ain't going to see the light. But then, but then, she knows what I'm talking about. But then understanding the truth of this. Why did Jesus do what he did? Let's read. Look at this. It's, we're going. Listen, we're fast forwarding to the future. This is after everything said and done. After everything is said and done. After the, after we go into this new dimension with Christ Jesus, look what it says here. So he took me in the spirit. This is John. To a great high mountain, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. It shone with glory, with the glory of God, and sparkled like a precious stone, like jasper, as clear as crystal. Imagine that. The city wall was broad and high. The city wall was broad and high, with 12 gates, guarded by 12 angels, and the names of the 12 tribes of Israel were written on the gates. There were three gates on each side, so that means that the gates, the 12 tribes that we're talking about, we're talking about the 12 tribes that were assigned a moment around the tabernacle. We're not talking about the 12 sons of Israel. We're talking about the 12 tribes that were around the tabernacle. So what is that? That's Reuben, that's Issachar, that's Jephthah, that's, uh, no, let's start, let's start, let's do it in order. That's Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, that's Reuben, Simon, uh, Simeon, Gad, that's Manasseh, Ephraim, and Benjamin, that's Dan, Asher, Naphtali, all twelve that were around the tabernacle. Who's with me? Amen. But then what other twelve is there? So we got twelve this, twelve that, twelve this, but what else is there? There were three gates on each side, east, north, south, and west. The wall of the city had 12 foundation stones. 12, what's the word? Foundation. What's the word? Foundation. foundation. 12 foundation stones. Can anybody define foundation for me? Give me more. Base. Structure. That holds this up. There's a foundation. Who's with me? Amen. So these 12 foundation stones are none other than, and on them were written the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Wow. Hold on. Whoa, 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 wait. The 12 apostles of the Lamb were written on the 12 stones? Hmm. 
So let me go through this word real fast. Let me go to Acts chapter 1. Because it can't be what I'm thinking. No, it can't be. Because I just finished reading who those 12 apostles are, right? right? I didn't say 12 disciples. I said 12 apostles of the Lamb. Not of the lion. Because if it was of the lion, it would be the resurrected Christ. Right. Well, that's good. 12 uh, apostles of the lamb because he was still in the state of a lamb for the slaughter. Yeah. That means it's before the cross. So 12 apostles of the lamb are the ones whose names are written on there. We have a problem, Houston. That's good. That's good. Jesus. Uh -oh. So you're going to Acts chapter 1. And of course, this is what most people think, right? We'll go to verse 12. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, a distance at a half of, of a mile away. When they arrived, they went to the upstairs room of the house where they were staying. Here are the names of those who were present. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all met together and were constantly united in prayer along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, several other women, and the brothers of Jesus. That includes James and Jude. Right. During this time when about 120 believers were together in one place, Peter stood up and addressed them. Brothers, he said, the scriptures had to be fulfilled concerning Judas, who guided those who arrested Jesus. This was predicted long ago by the Holy Spirit. Speaking through King David, Judas was one of us and shared in this ministry with us. He was one of us and shared in the ministry with us. In other words, he did everything we did. Right. That was Judas. Right. Judas had bought a field with the money he received for his treachery. Falling headfirst there, his body split open, spilling out all of his intestines. The news of his death spread to all the people of Jerusalem, and they gave the place the Aramaic name Akeldama, which means field of blood. Peter continued. This is written in the book of Psalms where it says, let his home become desolate with no one living in it. It also says, let someone else take his position. So he kind of used the word right there. Kind of used so now we must choose a replacement for Judas from among the men who were with us the entire time we were traveling with the Lord Jesus. So whoever this is has to be somebody who was with us from the very beginning, from the time he was baptized by John the Baptist until the day he was taken from us. Whoever it is that we're going to choose has to be somebody who was with us from the time that Jesus went in the water all the way to the time he ascended into heaven. That's what I'm saying. Whoever is chosen will join us as a witness of Jesus' resurrection. So they nominated. <laughs> Sounds like a democracy to me. So they nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. And they all prayed, oh Lord, you know every heart. This is what happens in church sometimes. <laughs> Lord, you know every heart. Show us which of these men you have chosen as an apostle to replace Judas in this ministry. So for those who say, first of all, for those who say there weren't any other apostles after the apostles, they already picked one even afterwards. Right after, during the time, Lord, show us an apostle to replace an apostle. To replace Judas in this ministry, for he has deserted us and gone without where he belongs. Gone where he belongs. He's dead, right? Then they cast lots. So after, you know, <laughs> after asking the Lord, Lord, show me. Lord, show me. Lord, make me wealthy. Lord, I seek to be wealthy. I seek to be able to. Expand your kingdom. Then you go and scratch and stuff. 
<laughs> As if he needs a scratchy thing to make you wealthy. Somebody say amen. It's okay. The desire to be somewhere, try to help God in the process. Do you know what happens when you try to help God? You get an Ishmael. Some of you know that. So, 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 so we understand Ishmael was a product of Abraham saying, I got this. Bring her. Who told you it was her? Why couldn't that have been the womb that God gave you as your wife? Because you thought it was impossible, so now you're trying to find another means of getting it done. God, I know, yeah, you're in this, Lord. You know my heart. No, you don't know what I'm talking about. You know my heart, because some of y'all don't be scratching. You, know, yeah, yeah. you know my heart, Lord. Give me that other five, nine, ten, ten. That's you, Lord, I hear you. We're scratching it up, hoping that God is going to look at you and go, yes, I know you're going to fund the kingdom. You can't fund the kingdom if your faith is not strong enough to go beyond the scratching. Because when you get the money, you're going to take care of you. And then you're going to get to a place where 10% is a whole lot. That's too much. Because you're going to calculate 10% of 5 million. And all of a sudden, that's a whole lot because you never had that before. Now you're thinking about, well, maybe if I give half, at least it's something. I think if I give 50,000, it's something. I'll give it something. It's okay. I'll give 50,000. At least God is smiling at me. I'll just give that. That's a preaching. I got to still teaching. Here we go. So they picked Matthias. Matthias was now chosen. But by the time they picked Matthias, guess who's a lion? Jesus is already alive. You can't say he's an apostle of the Lamb. Come on. We never hear about Matthias. We don't hear about Matthias. We, we only hear this one time Matthias is chosen. One time. Matthias. Matthias. Never hear about Matthias ever, ever again. Because the Lamb didn't pick him. Others picked him and it wasn't the Lamb. So then if we go back to Revelation 21, then who in the world is the 12th one? Then you have some other people that would say, well, then it's Paul. It has to be Paul. So they'll go to Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9, I'm not going to read it right now, but write it down. So you can read it on your own. Acts chapter 9 is his encounter. And of course, in this they'll say, well, at least see, he had an encounter with Jesus. Jesus saw him and spoke to him. But he's still not the apostle of the Lamb. You can't explain that one. He's still an apostle of the lion. The resurrected Christ. The resurrected Christ was the one who visited him. It wasn't Jesus of Nazareth who was still a lamb. Ah. So we have a dilemma. And this, and this dilemma that we have, just for those who think that I'm not the word, this dilemma that we have is really clear. That means that the one who betrayed Jesus has his name up in heaven as a foundation stone. How, how in the world is this foundation stone foundational? I read it to you guys. Stone have Judas on there. And the journey continues to get thick. So now we have a problem because Judas right now is the only candidate for the one who is to be on the stone. Judas is the only candidate to be the one who's the 12 and selected by the Lamb. The 12 apostles of the Lamb, we read who they are. They were given authority. Yes, Judas cast out demons. Yes, Judas healed the sick. Yes, Judas did everything that every other disciple apostle did. He did it all. How crazy is that? Because he, the, the role that Judas had to play in this was probably the most important role. Amen. So then I go to Matthew 10, because I still don't want to get to the gusto. Let's go to Matthew 10. So then Matthew 10, no, no. <laughs> we, we, we're not, yeah, I'm going to dance. Today I'm going to dance, and you're going to watch me dance today. So we go to Matthew 10, and... 
And we, we find something here that, that Jesus says, uh, verse 32, what he says. Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge them before my Father in heaven. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. If you deny me here on earth, you have zero access to heaven because you will be denied. Is everybody with me on that? Is that what the word says? Yes. If you deny me here on earth, I will deny you in front of my Father. So then we get another dilemma that's pretty interesting. There is someone who did deny Jesus on earth during his ministry. And he didn't deny, deny him once. He denied him three times. <laughs> three times denial. And yet Jesus was trying to find a way to resolve his dilemma. He was still one of the disciples. Peter was one of the disciples of apostles whom Jesus loved. Did Jesus love Judas? Yes. Yes. As a matter of fact, today is called for the love of Judas. <laughs> Write that one down. For those of you there. For the love of Jesus. Look, 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 look. Peter denied Jesus three times. He was disqualified just as disqualified as Judas was when he decided to take his life. Yes. Wow. Disqualification that had to be then turned around. And Jesus then turns it around for Jesus because, for, for Jesus, he did turn around for Jesus. For Peter, he turns it around for Peter. When he meets with Peter, while Peter's still alive, of course, he meets him and he asks him three times, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Take care of my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my lamb. He's telling him three times, what he did in, against him wow. so, to redeem him mm. wow. of what he said three oh, times. Wow. He did it three... Oh, let me, let's read it because y'all look at me like I'm crazy. Let's go to John 21. So John 21. It's going to get better. I'm not, I'm not going to go right to it. I'm not going to go right to it. You're going to see this right here. Look what it says here. After breakfast, because Jesus ate breakfast, at the resurrection, you know, you still can eat, right? At the breakfast, after he cooked for them and ate, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, not Peter, Simon, the same Simon that the devil wanted to sift. He didn't say Peter, he said Simon. Your old nature, Simon, son of John. Old nature, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs. Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question again. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Again. Yes, Lord, Peter said. You know I love you. I take care of my sheep. A third time, he asked. Simon, son of John, do you love me? For the third time, this time there won't be a crowing of a rooster. Peter was hurt. The same kind of hurt or a different kind of hurt. Because the third time he said, I don't know who he is, he felt pain. The word says he cried. It was one of those cries that you do with the ugly face. You don't know the ugly face cry. He cried. This time he felt hurt again, but this time he was wisely questioning him. Not realizing that this time was to redeem him. You know, look at the Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, and feed my sheep. I'm not going to get into the feeding and the, and the taking care of. That's not today's class. But what I want to show you is that there was a plan for redemption because as it stood before this point, Peter did not qualify. I got you. Peter did not qualify. 
because he denied him. And according to what Jesus said, you denied me, and I will deny you. So let me make you right. And the love dominated the denial. So then I ask you a question. Did he love Peter more than he loved Judas? No, it's right. No. Let's get it. So then God took me to John chapter 13. And now that I was so curious, I'm like, Lord, okay, what are you trying to show me? It took me step by step. And in John 13, he showed me something. And, and before I go to John 13, just so that people know that I understand that the word shows a lot of other stuff, I'm going to give you John 17 first. Let's go to John 17 first. Before we go to John 13, only because I want to make sure that, that those who are the naysayers get their nay first. And know that we understand what the nay is. Right. Amen. Right. Thank you, guys. So, chapter 17, verse 12 says, this is Jesus speaking now. During my time here, I protected them by the power of the name you gave me. I guarded them so that no one was lost except the one headed for destruction, as the scripture foretold. Some Bibles say the son of perdition. But let me remind you of before the cross. Before the cross... Every person around Jesus was a son or daughter of perdition. If not, he would not have died on the cross. His death on the cross is what saved us and redeemed us. So understand that him, him giving that truth, that truth does not negate the fact that there's a plan, even for the one headed that way, to destruction. I want to throw that in there. Let's go to John 13. Ready? Here we go. Now Jesus was, this is by the way, verse 21. Jesus was very troubled, was deeply troubled, and he explained, I'll tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at each other, wondering who he could mean. The disciple Jesus loved was sitting next to Jesus at the table. I wonder who that one could have been. John. Yeah. John. The one that Jesus loved. <laughs> Simon Peter motioned to him to ask, who is he talking about? So that disciple, the one that Jesus loved, leaned over to Jesus because he had access mm -hmm. and asked, Lord, who is it? Jesus responded, it is the one to whom I give the bread I dip in the bowl. And when he had dipped it, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. When Judas was, had eaten the bread, Satan entered into him. Then Jesus told him, hurry and do what you're going to do. That's a lot right there. Oh, it is. Let that sink in for a moment. Watch the scenario. Jesus is at the table. You got John next to him. Peter's trying to figure out who he's talking about. Peter signals to John. John goes, I got this. That's not John right to right? I got this. I got this. I know, I know you can't talk to him. I got you. Who's the one? Jesus reaches over and goes, it's the one who does this, who puts, who dips in at the same time that I did. The word says that when that took place, Satan entered into him entirely. So what does that mean, folks? That means that in the past, Satan was not in him yet. That everything that Judas was doing, the stealing, the thievery, all that stuff, he was doing on his own concupiscence. He, had, he was doing it based on his own. It wasn't the devil doing it. It was Judas doing it. But all of a sudden, now at this point in the venture, Judas gets possessed. Not a little bit. Entirely. So watch this. He gets possessed. 
and the devil enters into him completely. Then Jesus tells him, hurry and do what you're going to do. Who is he talking to? So it wasn't Judas that he was telling to hurry up and do what you're going to do? He's telling this to Satan, not Judas. Because to be completely possessed means that you are out of control. And it also means that Judas couldn't betray Jesus under his own ability. Because had he been able to do it under his own ability, he would not have needed to be possessed. If he was able to do it the way he was stealing money, he would have just done it. Because he was stealing money without Satan inside of him. But to betray Jesus is another level. And Judas Iscariot could not betray Jesus without being fully possessed. So now let's take a walk to the courtroom. Let's go to the earthly courtroom. On earth. Stop it. You enter the courtroom. And the first thing you want to figure out is if you are fully capacitated in committing the crime. You go to the court and they want to know whether or not you are in your full faculties to commit the crime you committed. They want to know if you are doing it with a full knowledge of what you're doing. So what happens? If the judge finds that you are not able to fully put your world together, then that means that you can't get sentenced the way somebody who has the capacity would get sentenced. Okay, I saw some other hands real fast, so I'm going to go here, here, and here. Let's, I, I want hands, but not so many hands so people don't lose their thread. So, fast, go. Microphone, right behind you. Okay, you asked a question. If um, his love for Peter was the same with, with Judas. Um, redemption happened before redemption happened. So, but he already foresaw that. So he, he knew that he was going to redeem Judas, so he wanted to have the same equal love for, um, for Peter by doing the same thing that he already did before it was done. You know what's crazy? I understood you. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but praise God, you, you're right. You're right. For those who understood, he's actually right. Right there. You don't have a mic back there? You don't have a mic back there? Praise God. <laughs> Um, go, going back a little bit to uh, the conversation with John and Jesus and Peter, um, it, it, the, the description of it was a, a little bit different than the way that it's usually told. Because when, when we hear the, the, the story of the Last Supper, it's usually portrayed that Jesus answers John to everybody. Right. But the way that you're describing it is a little bit different. Can you explain it a little bit? So, it wasn't everybody's conversation. It was it was between them. Why? Because Jesus was in a place where, if you know anything about Jewish uh, history or Jewish uh, customs and cultures, the oldest would be on one side and the youngest would be on the other. So it was it was kind of like one of these type things. And there's a description of you know the Last Supper, and we see like this big table, and you know you see. It's not quite like that, but just know that there was a connection between that moment where Peter and John were next to. They got to see. They were, they were, they were not, that conversation was not for everyone. And so when they saw that Judas left, no one questioned because Judas always left. Right. He's like that person who would leave, you know, no pun intended, please, nobody take offense. The person who always leaves before it's over. The service is over. They leave. You don't question it. You know they left. You don't even go, so where's such and such? You know they left. Judas was that type of dude who would leave, who was always going, so there was no question on where he went. Not to mention, there were more than just 12 amongst them. So it was easier, easier to maneuver, which is what I just talked about the other day. Amen. I don't know if that's what you were aiming for. Um, just 
my <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I think it worked. Uh, no, just the just the fact that um the the what Jesus told to John was more of a private matter between the two, as far as it's the one whom I did like he basically got a secret. Yes. So it was he was the only one that was told it's the one whom I did correct. The bread. And, Not Peter, everybody. and Peter heard as well. And, and Peter heard as well. So or, or, in other words, Peter was being told. Remember, the conversation was supposedly in quotes. John was the intermediator between Peter and Jesus. Right. So the other disciples didn't hear that. No. Okay. That is accurate. And over here. So the scenario of Judah and his Judas. Um, Judas sorry, and his possession is the same scenario as you spoke about in your book about suicide. Very good. We're going there. Amen. Very good. We're going there. Let's 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 slowly creep to that place. <laughs> good book, by the way. Amen. 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 Okay, si la pregunta fue en Spanish. Okay, pero if the question was the eh, question for you. For the love of Judas. The example is more for us. To have patience with those who are coming. The answer is going to be in this. As I proceed, that question that you have, that I know you have right now, is going to be answered. Yeah. There's a lot of questions that I'm not going to rise up, but you'll see that as we continue on our journey, right. mm -hmm. that there's going to be a lot of questions answered throughout. Yes. Yes. I'm limited with time, so I want to make sure that I want to end at 9.15 and end it there. Right? Do we all got to do this in time? We're going to get there. <laughs> so, we understand that there's a problem here, right? And I took it to the courtroom. The courtroom states that if one is not able to really process, that that means that they are not guilty of the crime that they committed. It's like a child, right? Let's look at, look at it from that perspective. A child that does something that is wrong, and doesn't really think about it. Now, in this case, it's possession. It's not immaturity. It's possession. And when you're completely possessed to do something, that means that your desire is no longer based on you. It's based on that which inhabits you. Right. Everybody with me? Amen. So God being a just God, he has to keep into consideration that Judas didn't commit the crime under his full concupiscence. Right. That he didn't move in his full faculties. That Satan took over his body. And if you pay attention after Satan left. Yeah. Satan left him. When he left, he, was, he felt remorse. Wow. He tried to move it to repentance, but it was too great. Wow. That he was consumed by the sickness called suicide. Or should I say he was consumed by the sickness called depression that leads into the end result called suicide. Amen. It's like when you are sick with some type of addiction. You will continue with the addiction until it kills you and takes you out. So, the next thing comes up. So hold on a second, Lord. So what, you telling me that Judas' name was on there as well? You mean to tell me that his life was plotted already? That him being the son of perdition, that he was lost? And that you are intricately trying to find a way to die on the cross. It has to be based on betrayal. And Judas ends up being the candidate. And that Judas couldn't do it under his own ability, but rather had to be possessed 
to be able to do what he did. Amen. And yet, you tell me those three and a half years you loved Judas. And in those three and a half years you loved Peter. And you saved Peter from not being acknowledged by the Father. But what about Judas? On the cross, I started thinking, why was Jesus so anxious to die and make moves? Where was he going? What was his desire? Oh, pay attention, church. No, no, I'm no stop for a moment. Right? I don't want nobody to miss this thread. Where was he headed? Thank you. He had a game plan. Because the same game plan he had for Peter, he had to have one for Judas. My God. Because Judas represents humanity, who betrayed the Father time and again, and continues to do so. Amen. So let's go to First Peter. Let's go to First Peter, and we'll start with. Chapter 3. And we'll start with verse 18. Ready? 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Where did Jesus go? What was he in a hurry to do? What did he want to do? Ready? Here we go. Yeah, I'm going to hold off on questions for now. Amen. Is that what she said? Oh, uh, amen. No, no, no. I don't, I'm, it's rhetorical. Amen. Here we go. Ready? That's good. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. Meaning he did it one time. He doesn't have to do it again. Stop nailing Jesus to the cross again. Amen. He died once for all time. Stop nailing him again. Amen. Stop trying to say, oh, well, I'm back at the cross. No, you better be at the tomb. Wow. At the cross, we understand the beginning works of the cross, but you better not stay at the cross, because if you're still at the cross, he's still hanging there. You better go to the tomb and talk about how empty it is. Christ suffered for us, he works for all time, he never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. That's why he died, to bring you safely home to God. To bring you safely. Because there's a, there's a dangerously way. He said, I want to bring you safely home to God. That's why I'm dying on the cross. Come on. That was one right there. That was good. He suffered physical death. But he was raised to life in the spirit. So what did he do after he died? It says here, so he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Those who disobeyed God long ago. What's the key word there? Long ago. No. Disobey. So if we talk about a classified group, the classification of the group is a group that disobeyed God. And according to the word, if you disobey God, you are destined to death. Ah. You're not getting what I'm saying. So he goes down to preach the good news. What could possibly be good news for people who are in hell? Thank you, Lord. Those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat, only eight people were saved from the drowning in that terrible flood. And that water is a picture of baptism, which now saves you, not by removing dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a, from a clean conscience. It is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, good. So here I understand now that he went down with a purpose. He went down to minister. Now it makes sense because he's a judge and he's a good judge. A good judge will allow everyone the opportunity to accept him as Lord. Amen. A good judge will allow everyone. Listen carefully. He went down, preached the good news, and said, I'm giving you guys an opportunity. Because everybody that's alive, I gave an opportunity. Everybody's alive. Right now, it's live right now. I gave them an opportunity. It's not fair if I don't give you an opportunity. So this one time right now, I'm giving everybody in prison right now. All of you right now listening, I want you to know something. 
I'm going to tell you the good news. And if you paid attention to the person I said before, I came down. So the way God works is he sends a forerunner. So we know that before Jesus was put on the scene, John the Baptist was Amen. the one who introduced. So John the Baptist was the one who was the herald to Jesus. So we know that that's a tactic of God to bring somebody first before he shows up. Wow. So Judas's role was double. He goes down before Jesus dies on the cross. When he goes down, he talks about how much a mistake he made. Oh my God. I was with the one. Let me tell you about Jesus. 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 He's down there spreading the good news without knowing that the good news was going to come to him. The forerunner. Who's getting what I'm saying? Amen. Some of y'all can in your soul you're catching. Jesus. So who do you think raced when Jesus pops on the scene? Mm -hmm. It's me. <laughs> your friend. Three and a half years. I know I did wrong. And Jesus can say, You died before the cross. When you die, oh, I know I'm going to catch some slack. I love all of you out there. I know I'm going to catch some slack for this one. Listen, listen. A forerunner was needed even in hell. Come on. Listen carefully. I'm not talking about he does that now. I'm talking about that point in time. When he dies on the cross, he goes down to preach the good news to all those who died before. And one of the criteria was disobedient. He disobedient. So he preached. He preached what? He preached what? So he preached the good news. So that is why uh, verse, chapter, verse 6 of chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 6, says that is why the good news was preached to those who are now dead. So although they were destined to die like all people, they now live forever with God and the Spirit. Hmm. Some people have versions different from that. But here's the one that really blows my mind. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. I'm almost done. Ephesians chapter 4. See, because again, we're talking about a loving Christ. How is it possible for us to talk about the loving Jesus, right? And be comfortable with the fact that he was he condemned somebody to hell forever who did part of the job that was supposed to be done. Who was possessed by Satan when he did it. Come on somebody. How is it that we can be comfortable with saying my loving Jesus my Jesus of love when Jesus had to have had a game plan just like he had for Peter. He had a game plan for Peter. Peter denied him three times and Jesus said if you deny me here on earth I will deny you in front of my father. Condemn. Condemn. So what was the difference between that and Judas? So Judas now is, in my view, Peter was not possessed when he said that. But Judas was possessed entirely when he betrayed Jesus. So now Jesus... All that desire. Yes, he, he could he was not one with the father. Of course, that didn't that was hurting him. But he was like, listen, three hours and that's good. I die, I gotta go there. I gotta get my friend. For the love of Jesus. I leave 99, reckless love. Reckless love. I'll go get one. First time I'm releasing this, this revelation. Y'all are the first ones to hear this is historic. You're the first ones to hear this publicly. Historic. He made sure to acknowledge him down there. And see, what did, what did Jesus go to do? 
He went to what? Separate two places. Luke 16, 19 talks about the two places. Uh, the bosom, they call the bosom of Abraham. You got the bad side and the good side. It couldn't be close anymore. I got to separate this thing. I'm not telling you there is no hell, and I am not saying that if you go to hell now, you have that option. Right. Let's make that clear. What I'm saying is at the point of Jesus dying on the cross, he had to give everybody an opportunity to say yay or nay. If not, he's not a just God. But because he's a just God, even those who died, Years before, we're waiting for that moment. Right, right. That was their parole. Right. That was their parole. That was a change in the rules right. of the crack law. You don't know about the crack law, right? The crack law was changed up. People who had 20 more years to go ended up doing one more day. Because the law, the law changed. When, when the law changed, that's when now they're like, oh, I can leave. Case law, yes, it is now the point of redemption. I now added more to the covenant. The covenant is now brand new. It's not the old covenant. And this new covenant sets you free. So he came to tell them about their covenant. So this, all you got to do is accept me right now. If you believe on the Lord, you think that everybody would do that, right? I don't think everybody did. And some people just that hard. It's just that hard. I mean, they can see people dying around them and still say, no, I don't, I don't want to receive it. But Jesus gave everybody a chance that the day of judgment, when everybody has to be, has to give up an account, especially those who aren't Christian, right? Amen. You can't say you weren't given a chance. You were given an opportunity. So that means some people during the time of Adam and Eve, all that time after, they all were given the opportunity. Ephesians chapter 4. Let's go to verse, um, let's, let's go to verse 7. 5. 5. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. However, he has given each one of us a special gift from the generosity of Christ. That is why the scriptures say, when he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Notice that it says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to hell. That says lowly world. No, it's under the earth. He went there. And that's why there's a little asterisk next to that. Those who be having in the world. And the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. In other words, he went down, did what he had to do, redeemed who he needed to redeem. You think that if he spoke to captives and Judas was amongst them, you think Judas wasn't going to run and be like, yo, I'm right here with you. I'm not letting the second opportunity by. I died before the cross. He committed suicide before the cross. If it was after the cross, he was hit. But it was before the cross. So he got to hear the good news. But he knew the good news. And he became part of the spreading of the good news. Telling everybody about the good news. Jesus pops on the scene, I told you. There he is. That's him. The one, one I was talking about. And Jesus starts talking and all of a sudden, boom. But Jesus also wanted to make a pit stop. And he went to drop off all the garbage in hell. What's the garbage in hell that he's found? Sin. Everything that has to do with sin. Even death was in the back, in the backpack. Death Sickness, disease, poverty was in the backpack of Jesus. When he went down, he said, oh, I forgot, take this load. Wow. 
That's the reason why when we don't have a revelation of what Jesus did on the cross, we are satisfied with our sickness. I'm sick. I'm just sick. It's when he it's when he wills. When he what he wills. He died so that wouldn't be the case. Yeah, I'll hear you when you get to heaven. No, no, it's now. His desire to get us to a place now. So what happens? Now it makes sense. Jesus' name is written on there for a reason. Judas Iscariot was a friend. He was a friend of Jesus. And was chosen as an apostle. Oh. He was chosen as an apostle to do what? To complete the task. He was the knife in the hand. Come on. Without him, we wouldn't be here right now. I know that's messed up to say, right? No, because some, some people even put what? Without the criminal called Judas, we wouldn't know about the resurrection. It took Judas Iscariot for us to understand the resurrection power. He was the last of the, of the apostles that he talked about because he, he needed a whole class. And this doesn't talk about how people can get away with stuff because I don't know how, why are we so happy about people getting locked up and going to prison? Why do we want to be judges? Why is it that we desire so much to hear they got in trouble. Yeah, God, you didn't get away. You got him. You didn't get away with it. Why? Why is it so hard to hear a story like Judas? Why do we want him to be the son of perdition that we all were? Because everybody in this room was once the son of perdition until you found Jesus. Amen. And being a son of perdition simply means that you don't know your way. You're lost. Perdition means lost. And I believe that God right now is helping us to understand by this truth. And I'm going to write a book on this. Amen. Amen. I think mean, I mean, I mean, there's so much more. Those who know the, the, the whole breakdown, as you can see, I didn't, I didn't touch on a whole lot of stuff that I normally would. And I got some, I, I told, I've shared with some, some of my, uh, my colleagues and the brothers, uh, apostles. Some were, you know, like, wow, you ready for that? And I said, yeah, why not? Anything to promote the love of Jesus, why not? I'm not talking about the getaway of Jesus. I'm talking about the love of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> you know, good, yeah, because if, if you focus on his getaway, then you're going to be upset because he got away. Wow. I'm focusing on the love of Jesus that he would go that far. Now what he did for Peter, he also did for Judas. And his love goes that deep. That he does not want not one of us to be lost. Not one. The word says that he, he's ready to, to, to rip out of the hand of the enemy, rip a soul out of the hand of the enemy. My question to you, it goes into the suicide thing. That's why if somebody tells me somebody committed suicide, I'm not gonna go automatically, they went to hell automatically. I've been raised with that in church. And, oh, committed suicide, hell. Stop, get off the seat of God. Your rear is too small. Oh, yeah. Only God can sit there. Amen. Get off. Allow him to be a judge. You don't know how sick that person was. You don't know if depression became a sickness that dominated like cancer in the mind of that person. You don't know. Stop it. And in the book I touch on someone is saved on a Sunday and died on Monday based on that sickness. Was the sickness stronger than the salvation? Listen carefully. 
We can, in a person in a wheelchair, we're quick to say, okay, because you see it, right? They accept the Lord as their Savior. They, they end up accepting Him, and they, you know, they die the next day. You saw them on Sunday, they died Monday based on the sickness. Oh, they went to heaven. Oh, heaven, 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 heaven. But what about the person who's mentally in a wheelchair? Not physically, mentally. Their soul was, uh, was, was troubled. Then they die. What is part of that sickness? Depression leads into that sickness or leads into that result. And it is a cancer. Depression is a cancer. It's a cancer of the soul. Anxiety is a cancer. And I, I want, I'm hoping that those who are interpreting that the interpretation, praise God, was accurate. Somebody corrected me the other day and I took the correction. There's a difference between translation and interpretation. I'll never forget that. So translation is what you do when you write. Interpretation is what you do with it when it's verbal, when you're speaking. I hope nothing was lost in the interpretation. And those who write it down, I pray that you have it strong enough for the translation. Wow. <clears throat> because this message, as I know it's going to be rejected by many, there will be many that will understand even their own condition for the Judas that resides in here. How many of us betray Jesus? Come on, guys. You can't be so self-righteous. How many of us betray, have betrayed Jesus time and again? If you don't raise your hand, then you just betray him right there. So then now you can raise your hand. You understand what I'm saying? So praise God. You know, I want to end at 2115. But I ended at 2119. We're still not done. For the sake of those who you know right now have been suffering, those who are in need of the resurrection power of Jesus Christ, those who require healing, not even having stuff, right? There was still some stuff that didn't get tossed down, right? But I believe that the church received what they needed to receive right now. Amen. Now you don't go into condemnation. For if the story of, of Jesus and Judas leads you to condemn, then that's a problem. I dare not even condemn Judas Iscariot, son of perdition. I dare leave that for God. Of course, the word doesn't say there'll be surprises in heaven. I don't know where that came from. That's not in the word. There will be surprises in heaven. It sounds good. I'm sure there will be. I'm sure somebody's going to pop up and be like, I'm here. And you're going to go, you? <laughs> and that person going to say, thank God God is the judge and not you. Amen. Had you been given the authority to judge? <laughs> Half of us would be fried chicken right now. Wow. <laughs> your love go for us? How, how much do you love us, my God? And we got to start it with those who were your Jerusalem. Those who were your Jerusalem were your twelve. They were your Jerusalem. Not one of them. Your desire was for not one to be lost. And the key here is that Judas didn't do it under his own ability. Right. And 
I believe that information is enough to show me that God is a good judge. A loving judge, a judge nonetheless. And he will judge us. Because it's his job. So I'm just going to ask those of you who desire to pray for uh, ministers, I want you all to pray today. Ministers. I want you all to pray today. I'm so going to ask that you guys move these chairs. Those of you who are seeking prayer today, maybe the revelation did not reach you. Maybe you're still stuck. Even those at home, maybe you're still stuck. Maybe you, you're, you're going, no, that's, oh no, now I know where they are. That's what you're thinking. Listen, I urge you to identify with the love of the master. That he will go through walls for you. How does that song go, that reckless love song? How does that reckless song go? That reckless love song. I didn't say you. Jesus. Praise God. Minister to that minister. How does that go? Because it's a reckless love. To go to, go to hell. Come on. That's not part of the song, but think about it. It's reckless. Reckless.